Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. We're starting our weekend off right with watches. And reach out to me, T Masso, at thewatchbox.com, because everything you see here is for sale. I have full pricing, accessories, paperwork, extra photos, and details. If you're looking to sell a watch or trade, we are always looking to acquire. T Masso at thewatchbox.com. To buy, trade, or sell, we pay cash, we pay fast, we will buy your entire collection, no upper limit on value paid. All right, jumping straight in, the watch I promised you. This is the Omega Speedmaster Professional Moonwatch Speedy Tuesday 2, also known as the Ultraman. Inspired by a reference 145012 featured in the 1971 and 1972 Return of Ultraman TV series, this watch is not a retro re-edition as it includes a lot of elements not featured on that 1967 watch. The original would have featured a step dial with a orange chronograph seconds hand. This one has the orange seconds hand with a black stripe down the center, a special note that Ultraman can can only be giant for three minutes, hence three orange minutes on the minutes register. We have orange hashes outboard the numerals. If you look carefully, you can see Ultraman's cowl on the constant seconds display, as well as a seconds hand that looks like his beta capsule. We have an orange tachymeter lettering. We'll fire this up, wind it a little bit. Mechanically, it's a caliber 1861 Moonwatch movement. It comes with two straps, this Ultraman-themed NATO, as well as an also Ultraman-themed black calfskin. Even the strap minders are fun, as you can see a tribute to the Fratello Watch's Speedy Tuesday series that spawned this watch and its predecessor, the 2017 Project Alaska 3. Has a light crystal, 42 millimeter stainless steel case. You can't see it on the back, but it mentions both Speedy Tuesday and the edition number, which is 2012 pieces, because that was the year that Speedy Tuesday, a celebration of Speedmaster history, was established on Fratello watches. Now, you can't see Ultraman's cowl glowing, but you can see the Luminova by night. This watch comes with an elaborately themed Ultraman themed boxed set with a UV activator so you can see the cowl glow orange. Let's do a quick wrist shot here. I should mention the watch wears considerably larger on its NATO than it does on its calfskin strap. And I should also mention that you come well equipped to the task of fitting the strap because the UV light with this watch is also a strap tool, a retractable strap tool no less. So here it is on my wrist. Appreciate that it is quite a bit larger on a NATO as NATO watches always are. Put it on the leather strap and it's considerably more compact as well as quite a bit thinner. Now another feature worth mentioning is that it features an applique Omega logo on the dial just like the original. It's a vintage Omega logo. You see it there, there, and then on the pin buckles of both straps. So it is a very fun vintage themed watch uh, that's a celebration of tokusatsu man in a suit action shows, as well as the history of the Omega Speedmaster Professional. It's both science and science fiction in one. Now jumping into another watch that represents a considerably more traditional take on culture. This is the 250 piece limited edition 25th anniversary Langa 1. You could see on the reverse side, Langa's manufacturer, as well as the names of the two most illustrious re-founders of the brand from 1990, German watch executive Gunter Blumlein and Walter Langa, the last watchmaking scion of the Langa family. Lovely engraving on the case back, which I should mention is a Hunter case back. You pop it open and there's a lot to love. It's a Modern caliber L121, and it's a three-day power reserve, beautifully hand-finished. The balance cock is hand-engraved here, but you can see it's also been blue ink filled and blazoned with the number 25. We have individual edition numbering out of 250. You can see you get the white gold case back here, as well as the sapphire case back, so it really is the best of both possible worlds. You don't have to choose between the two. The dial is a solid block of sterling silver that's been cut, and you can see it's really been elaborately finished compared to a standard Longa one. The galvanized silver white color is on top of the silver base. We have blue numerals for the double digit date or the panorama datum, and you can see that we have recesses within the dial, and everything has a nice soft frosted finish. It's a good looking watch at 38.5 millimeters in diameter. I'll zoom out a little bit so you get a better sense of scale. But this is a watch that a woman could wear. You don't have to wear a little Longa. It's almost, traditional by the standards of modern watches. 38.5 seems almost quaint, but this is the original case size from the first Longa 1 1994, and it has serious staying power. A lovely handmade German watch. It comes with a feature rarely seen 
on longer time pieces, a full deployant clasp, and not just that, but a double deployant clasp. So 25th anniversary special edition from Longa. Now, if you like the silver and blue look, but you don't have quite the coin and you need to get wet, we have here a 2022 Cartier edition. This came out alongside an all blue model, but this is the Cartier Santos Large Blue. We have a lovely striated blue bezel held by polished screws. This is the Santos Large from the family that debuted in 2018, so it's the latest model. It's only 9.4 millimeters thick. It's about 39 millimeters from side to side, and then it is 47.5 millimeters from lug to lug, so it wears quite compact. It's 100 meters water resistant. It is 1,200 gauss anti-magnetic, and it fits beautifully on my wrist, which is 16 centimeters. Well, this is the Santos Large. It's not objectively a large watch. It fits low slung, hugs the wrist, beautifully made, uh, wonderfully tight tolerances to the bracelet, which feels like a million dollars. And that's impressive considering it has quite a few features, including a quick switch system that allows you to swap between this and Cartier straps. And then on the bottom, we also have a little system that allows you to quickly and easily remove removable links. And I don't always have enough fingers fingernail to do this easily, but you can see just by pressing my fingernail into an access switch on the bottom, I eject the screw, or I should say it's not a screw, it's a bar that retains the bracelet. You pull it out, and once it reaches the end of its travel, the bracelet actually separates. This is called SmartLink. It allows you to resize the bracelet without tools, and you can see how many of those little access toggles there are on each side, you have quite a bit of adjustability. And again, you would never guess this bracelet has so many moving parts. It feels as rock solid as anything from Rolex. Cartier is smart too. You can't pull that retaining bar out of the link, so you're not gonna lose it. They know that if you could separate these two pieces, you would lose them. So they keep them conjoined. Beautifully made, beautifully rendered. Oh, and by the way, let's do a loom shot. So you know, just to be sure that this is a full service sports watch. All right, so that is the Cartier Santos Large, a modern take on the first ever pilot's watch. Here is a watch for adventurers of all stripes. Launched in 2021, this is the two-tone Explorer. The 124273 in yellow gold and 904L steel, 36 millimeters in diameter. It has an Explorer dial in black lacquer with yellow gold garnishing, and you can see Rolex's chromolite blue loom, which they make in-house. They also make their own golds and steels. They have their own foundry. They make cases, clasps, bracelets. They smelt their own alloys. They use 904L steel because it's more resistant to corrosion even than 316. You can see on my wrist, the watch wears beautifully. The 36 millimeter case on the Explorer, the date just, the date date, it was always considered to be a men's size, and it was through most of the 20th century. But today, a lady can happily wear a 36 millimeter watch and look the part upscale, sophisticated, and a connoisseur, male or female, it does not matter. This watch works well either well. What you will like to know is that either way you wear it, lady or man. It's 45.5 millimeters end link to end link across the wrist, and it's low enough to fit underneath any cuff. Now, let's jump back to the late 1990s with this Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Perpetual Calendar, an extraordinary combination of, well, let's take a quick look. You can see this is alternately steel and platinum, and you know this because you can see it says SP on the reference. So in general, when you see a polished bezel or polished center links on a Royal Oak, it means that you're looking at platinum. So for example, on the R&D number two, the ultra thin perpetual calendar, you have that full polished bezel. And it's easy to tell that it's platinum because the bolts in the bezel are white gold. You can see how much darker they are than the ultra white platinum. The case is otherwise steel with platinum. The center links of the bracelet are platinum. We have a watch that is 39 millimeters in diameter, the traditional Royal Oak size, with a lovely large hobnail Grand Tapisserie dial. Since the early 1980s, the Royal Oak Perpetual Calendar has been the original Royal Oak complication, and it is extravagantly rendered. We're going to open up this clasp right here and take a look at the case back. We have a handsome Royal Oak-themed faceted and bolted rotor, and you can see that it's actually not a rotor. It's a mask because the rotor goes all the way around the movement. This is the 1120 
or I should say 2120, 11, 1120 is what Vacheron calls this JLC 920 of Bausch. Audemars Piguet, Patek Philippe, and Vacheron paid for the development of this watch movement by Jajir Lecoult in the late 60s. JLC created the 920, which is a base movement that's automatic and has only a 2.4 millimeter thickness. Vacheron, Patek, and AP used this movement. JLC never used it. None of the other JLC customer brands ever used it. So this movement has been exclusive to the Holy Trinity today. Vacheron and AP still use the movement. It is beautifully finished with broad luminous Cote de Genève solarization of the crown wheel core and the ratchet wheel, mile wide beveling. And then you have this beryllium rotor that runs all the way around the watch. So there are four ruby rollers that prevent the beryllium Ring and the mass itself from crashing into the base plate or the bridges. That's how the base can be so thin. And of course, it's a perpetual calendar, so you don't need to worry about regular length months or leap years. And it's a traditional 39 millimeter Royal Oak, which means it wears beautifully, even on a smaller wrist like mine. Low slung, it fits easily underneath a sleeve and made of steel and platinum. It has a satisfying heft to it. This is AP at Zenith, and I don't mean to reference the brand Zenith. This is peak AP from the 90s, back when they made watches with absolutely no concessions to mass production. This is a timepiece that leaves nothing to be desired. That said, some folks like bigger watches, and not everyone is down with a 39mm or 36mm Royal Oak. And for you, there is the 15400 ST, which we have here in the desirable blue dial variant. So the blue dial, generally reserved for premier independent retailers and AP boutiques. This watch is 41mm in stainless steel. It has the 60-hour power reserve caliber 3120 on the reverse side, which is an AP in-house movement. You can see that it wears nicely, and it has a serious advantage over any jumbo and that perpetual calendar, which is that this has a 50 meter water resistance, but it also has a screw down crown, so you can surface swim this watch. It wears large. Consider it more like a 42 or 43 millimeter round watch. That's always been the case with Royal Oaks. They wear larger than their size. You need to consider this almost a baby offshore more than a big Royal Oak. That said, at 9.9 millimeters thick, it will fit underneath the cuff. You may also be surprised by just how well loomed it is. I know I'm always taken aback by how well loomed a standard Royal Oak is, and you can see that to good effect on this example. Laurent Ferrier on a bracelet. If you were to tell me that you have a Laurent Ferrier on a bracelet, I would expect that it would be one of the recently released sports watches. That said, in 2021, Laurent Ferrier, The Rake, which is a style magazine, and Revolution, which is a watch magazine, came together to create this, a 12-piece limited edition envisioned by founder Wei Ko and realized by Laurent Ferrier. So what we have here is a Galley Classic Rake and Revolution with an autumn salmon dial, actually blackened gold hands, blackened tri-Arabic brigade style numerals, two different finishes on this dial. We have a sunburst and then we have an opaline matte. We have a vintage inspired Milanese bracelet from, well, probably from German manufacturer Steib, which is the go-to for this type of mesh bracelet, almost regardless of what brand is involved. It has vintage style straight bars, like a grand 50s or 60s dive watch, and you can see it's fairly easy to size as it uses conventional screws and removable links. So it's easy to wear, 40 millimeters in stainless steel. At 12 pieces made, this is truly a limited edition. We can always discuss what limited means, but when you're talking 12 pieces, the likelihood is you'll never see another one. To me, that is the definition of exclusivity. On my wrist, it wears beautifully. It's about 47.5 millimeters lug to lug. It's just over 11 millimeters thick, and again, 40 millimeters in diameter. It is gorgeous. It does come with a secondary strap. You get a calfskin strap with an Alcantara base. So if you don't like the look on the bracelet, you can absolutely swap it out to the other strap option. Now, taking a look at the case back, this is what you pay for with Laurent Ferrier. Finishing that, frankly, is the equal of what you'll get from more touted brands such as, well... Alang Unzona, Audemars Piguet, Vacheron Constantin. This compares favorably to even the likes of Carrie Voulainen and Gautier. Uh, it is really quite fine and a higher level of execution than you'll get at the APs and Jorns of the world. Now we have an automatic winder via micro rotor which moves silently on a jeweled staff with a ratchet. 72 hour power reserve with a single barrel which is impressive. You can see the bevels are a freaking mile wide here. We have a half bridge for the balance that's been black polished on its top, skeletonized and then it has one, two, three, four interior angles. We have one, two, three, 
four interior angles on the bridges themselves. And just look at how broad that englage is. That's the real kind. Started with a file and finished with some kind of wood, polished, mirrored, flawless. They also mirror finish all of the jewel sinks. So the jewel sinks have the same mirrored finish as the bevels. That's called a partridge eye treatment. We have a double direct impulse escapement with two nickel phosphorus wheels. There is no Swiss lever. The wheels directly impulse the balance in its direction of travel. It's free sprung, adjusted in six positions and it has an overcoil hairspring, so absolutely no refinement is left off. We have a gorgeous combination of uh, frosted and gilded bridges and plates, satinated wheels, a guilloche cut rotor, a black polished steel bridge for the rotor, a black polished steel bridge for the balance itself, and again, all of this from a brand that makes fewer than 200 watches a year, and this is one of 12 pieces in its edition, a very special watch. Okay, F. Pigeon, and this is a circa 2001 F. Pigeon Tourbillon Souverain. Uh, you can see that this is a fourth series Tourbillon Remontoir, you know, because it's got the flat Remontoir cock, and it's got the small bolts on the dial. So we have a lovely white gold dial, rose gold case, full factory bracelet, and this is an exceptionally rare combination. Of course, the Tourbillon Remontoir ran from... Well, if you include the Ruthenium's, it ran a little bit longer, but it ran from 1999 through 2004 when it was succeeded by the Gold Movement Watch. And this 38 millimeter case is the original brass caliber. It was a breakthrough piece when first announced. The first union of a wristwatch tourbillon with a Remontoir de Galate constant force device. The Remontoir is this little linear spring on the case back. It ensures that for 28 hours of the roughly 42 hour power reserve, the tourbillon escapement receives constant force, allowing constant amplitude allowing it to be very precisely regulated. It's six position adjusted, free sprung, and it has an overcoil, and those are not universal features of Jorn watches. You can see it's a filigree style wire tourbillon cage, beautifully delicate in its detailing with a rounded and black polished bridge for the tourbillon. Throw it on the wrist, it's an unusual sight as these early watches are uncommonly equipped with full factory bracelets. It gives it a little bit more substance and a lot more presence as this combination of rose gold on rose gold is simply blistering, blinding, and yet traditionally sized and shaped. It fits easily underneath the cuff, and it's only about 44.5 millimeters from lug to lug, so it wears quite nicely. It's under 10 millimeters thick. This is a true collectible piece. If you are an F.P. Journe diehard, you need to have one of the original four series of Tourbillon Remontoir or one of the Ruthenium's in your collection, and this definitely gives you an unusual point of access to that elite club. But some people like big watches and colorful watches and scratch-resistant watches, and I have to admit that a gold Jorn is not that. This, however, is a 100-piece limited edition from 2021. This is the Zenith Defi El Primero 21 Felipe Pantone by the Argentine-Spanish artist. We have a combination of his signature aesthetic dazzle patterns and, of course, Mr. Pantone, a man of many colors, decorating the Zenith Defi El Primero 21. Now, it's 44 millimeters in diameter and black ceramic. You can see he's also a sectioned the bezel with a sort of quadrille pattern. We also have his initials. We have his signature. And of course, we have two different movements in one case. We have the 360,000 vibration per hour escapement that regulates this one one hundredth of a second foudroyant. And then we have the 36,000 vibration per hour El Primero movement. The El Primero movement has a silicon escapement. Uh, the 360,000 has a conventional Swiss lever, and you can see that I can start and re start. It's not a mono pusher. There's absolutely no compromise here. It has a feature rarely seen on El Primero. As you can see, if I pull the crown, it stops the constant seconds tri-spoke. You can actually operate the two sides of the movement independently as they have separate power sources. So the watch can keep time even when the chrono runs down, and the chrono can keep running, albeit for only 50 minutes, when the watch runs down. The watch can automatically wind its time-telling functions, but then you manually wind its chronograph, and you do so uh, using this crown. There's a little power reserve indicator up at the top of the dial. 50 hour power reserve for the watch, 50 minute power reserve for the chronograph. It's chronometer certified and it has a 100 meter water resistance rating. You can see a lovely color spectrum on the reverse side and it is a very cool watch. Though large at 44 millimeters, all in rubber, sapphire and ceramic, it's super light and the ceramic is almost indelible, incredibly resistant to scratches, dents, scuffs and swirls. This is the kind of watch you buy when you're sick of scratching 
five and six figure luxury sports watches. And of course, it has a unique sound to it as you have the ultra high frequency and the 10 beat per second, 100 beats per second and 10 beats per second in the same watch. So this is quite a watch to hear as well as quite a watch to see. Let's do a quick darkness test. You could see that it does not feature any luminescence, so I want to be clear, this model, which has uh, Pantone-inspired colors on the hands and indices, is a sports watch, but not a loomed sports watch. If you want a loomed sports watch from a very cool micro brand, consider this. You probably know already, but this is the Stephen McGonagall Magon. The Magon Forza is a watch that's powered by a Le Joux Pere 7772, created by watchmaker Stephen McGonagall. He's one half of the other horological brothers, so much like many high-end watchmakers have created more accessible tenant brands to get people on a track to their aspirational watch. He has created Magon, which is below McGonagall in the hierarchy, but still very technically proficient. You wind up with a tonneau case in blackened titanium. You have a 250-piece limited edition. This is a sports watch, as you can see, water-resistant down to 100 meters. There is plenty of luminescence, and you can see the dial has a lot of depth to it. It's also a no-date, so it's beautifully balanced. We have Irish green for the hands as well as the brand script. And on the reverse side, Irish green again on the rotor. La Joux Pere 7772. Automatic winding, 55 hour power reserve, column wheel, and oscillating pinion chronograph. It's based on a 7750, but many La Joux Pere chronographs are based on a 7750. More importantly, is that this is one of the highest grades available from La Joux Pere, and it has significantly more power reserve. As a 7750 is typically 42 to 48 hours. This at 55 is going to give you more. You can see individual numbering out of the 250. The watch is 56.5 millimeters from lug to lug, and it is approximately 43 millimeters wide, so it is a large timepiece, make no mistake. I recommend you have a wrist of at least 17 centimeters circumference to wear this, but if you're looking for wrist presence, exclusivity, and a very cool independent brand from a truly impressive independent watchmaker, this is the way to go. Again, speaking of large watches from independent brands and chronographs, here's a fascinating one. You may not read this Habring COS Pilot ZM, or I should say ZM Pilot, as a chronograph at first glance, but it uses their COS system that was first developed in 2008. So I use the crown to actuate the chronograph. You can see, like a Le Mans 5100, I have my seconds and my 60 minutes at center. Now, this watch has an edition number of one for the 2020 model year. That's how you read Habring serials. Uh, so it's either the first or a piece unique, and I'm leaning towards the latter because it's almost impossible to find this combination of the Pilot ZM with the red hands, the black dial, and the quarter Arabic numerals. Now the watch is quite well loomed. It's a 42 millimeter steel case from Habring in Austria. Richard Habring makes only a few dozen watches a year, and this watch is part of that output. They try to make as much of the watch as possible in Austria. Now I activate the chronograph by turning one click counterclockwise. I stop the chronograph by turning one click clockwise. I can stop and restart. It's not like a mono pusher, but you can see if I do stop, then I turn the chronograph crown all the way, I reset it. Now here's what else I can do. If I pull it out to the intermediate position, I wind the watch. If I pull it out all the way, now I set the watch. That's how it works. So you have your chronograph seconds and 60 minutes display at center. You can see we have an all applique upscale matte black dial, very simple satin finished case, integrated lugs, strap tool holes, unsigned crown, turn it over, we have the A08 movement. Now this is made entirely by Habring, but it is based, again, loosely on the 7750 architecture. You could see a couple of signature elements of the 7750, such as the cam actuation, the clutch spring and clutch with the oscillating pinion, which is visible, and then you can see it beats away at 28,800 vibrations per hour, and it has a 48-hour power reserve. A very cool watch and super minimalist. If you were a fan of the old MIH watch, the original, this is going to be right up your alley. Absolute exclusivity, a super cool brand. For those who don't know Richard Habring, his resume includes IWC and Alangu Unzona, and he's been working with his wife, Maria, who is the other half of the Habring Squared. If you look carefully, you can see there's a little superscript on the name. So you actually get two Habrings, 
Richard and Maria for the price of one, and they make watches like this. The COS is one of their coolest and most emblematic innovations. And again, they make almost everything inside of Austria, either themselves or through local suppliers. We journey back to Switzerland and Le Brasseau with Audemars Piguet. This is the Audemars Piguet Jules Audemars equation of time, but it's much more than that. Okay, what do we have? We have a perpetual calendar with a moon phase. We have an equation of time that tells you the difference between mean time or average time within a time zone and the time that the sun is literally directly overhead. So every spot within a time zone does not have the sun overhead at the same time. They have to agree to an average throughout that time zone. So, for example, one area might be further east in a given time zone, another area might be further west. Although the clock shows noon in both of them, the sun will be relative to their standing at different positions overhead. So, the difference between solar, true solar noon, which is when the sun is directly overhead, and average clock time is the equation of time. And four times a year it will coincide, so this little sun hand on a serpentine will read zero four times a year. Otherwise, you'll find a maximum difference of minus 15 plus 15 minutes, but you need latitude to program the watch for sunrise and sunset. The perpetual calendar will work anywhere. The equation of time will work anywhere but you need latitude of a location in order for the equation of sunrise and sunset to correctly display those times on the dial. So this is an equation of sunrise, sunset, an equation of time, a perpetual calendar, and a moon phase. It's 43 millimeter in rhodium plated white gold because Audemars Piguet loves its ultra white white golds. You can see it's the Jules Audemars case. It has cool upscale welded on lugs. At 43 millimeters, it's large, but it's also fairly thin. So if you have the wrist for it, and I would say the wrist for it is no smaller than mine, it does lie fairly flat. Turn it all over and we are simply spoiled with riches, an embarrassment of opulence. We have this AP logo style rotor on an 1120 base. So this is the Audemars Piguet 1120 base. I talked to you earlier about AP and Vacheron using this movement. Well, AP makes it in-house. And so this is based on the old JLC 920, but extensively elaborated with, among other things, a Gyromax style free sprung balance and this extraordinary rotor, which is skeletonized beveled and freehand engraved. It has a 40 hour power reserve and it turns a 2808 module, which is what they call this complication. Note that the dial has tremendous depth and that the center features a pronounced guilloche cut from a rose lathe. It actually might be cut from a straight line machine because the lines are straight patterns. Uh, guilloche is generally performed using straight line machines and rose lathes. You can also see that we have white gold Roman numerals and white gold leaf hands at center. A very cool watch that comes with a matching single fold white gold deployment clasp. If you are in Connecticut, if you are in New Jersey, this equation of sunset sunrise is likely cammed correctly for your location. But remember, it's most sensitive to latitude. So you wanna be fairly close to New York to get the full benefit of sunset and sunrise. Every other function works anywhere else in the world. We love our independent brands here at Watchbox, and in 2011, the original horological brothers, the Grunefelds, not the McGonagalls, launched this, the 1 Hertz. 43 millimeters in titanium. This example is part of a limited edition of 30 pieces. The dial has tremendous depth. You can see that the seconds track for the deadbeat second stands proud of the dial, and so there's a lot of three-dimensional qualities here is we have applied tracks that are beveled and satinated. We have fired blue steel hands. We have black polished and faceted indices. We have a power reserve indicator, 72 hours, manual wind, two barrels. One barrel drives the time, that is hours and minutes. One barrel exclusively drives the jumping second. So this power intensive complication doesn't draw down the amplitude of the balance or cause wild fluctuations in the torque to the escapement. Taking a quick look, you can see this is a multi function crown. So when you're in setting mode, it indicates S, but it also activates hacking seconds. Now, if you want to return to winding the watch or just unhack it, you press again, the indicator switches to winding. Now I can wind the watch and you can see as I wind, the power reserve indicator starts arcing towards full. It is a deadbeat seconds display. The timepiece has a wonderfully sculpted titanium case 
that's thinner than you would think at about 13.4 millimeters. On the reverse side, you can see the movement two barrels, one dedicated exclusively to the deadbeat seconds. The bridges are all made of stainless steel. They're triple finished. Their interiors are media blasted to create this dark frosting. Then their edges have satination. The satin channels giving way on their sides to mirror polished anglage. Very difficult to finish steel bridges, but they finish the stainless steel bridges to show just how good they are. And Tim and Bart are quite good at making watches. You'll also note in a tribute to their Dutch heritage, orange leather on the bottom, we have blue buffalo on the top with an orange stitch, and then we have bell gable shaped bridges just like the roofs of traditional Dutch houses. We have a free sprung balance adjusted in six positions. The free sprung architecture is more reliable from a shock resistance standpoint, but also allows for finer tuning and it is adjusted in six positions. It also features an overcoil hairspring, so it will keep consistent time in any physical position with respect to gravity. Throw it on the wrist, you can see it wears nicely on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, even though this is probably the smallest wrist that would wear this watch. Being all sapphire and titanium, it is very light. The Grunefelds have closed their order books, but here at Watchbox, we are still open for business. And we have two spectacular pieces. Starting with this, this is the Vacheron Constantin Métier d'Art Great Explorers Edition Marco Polo. In honor of the Venetian explorer of the 13th century who traveled the Silk Road extensively in Asia, we have a 60-piece limited edition from the 2008 model year, and it's 40 millimeters in diameter. You can see in yellow gold, it features a miniature painted cloisonne and enamel dial. So you can see the little gold lines those are the cloisons, or the little gold wires that are used to bound the enamel paint. We have miniature painting of different figures and features of the trip. And then we have enamel, basically glass paint, used on a gold base, fired up to 20 times at 800 degrees centigrade to create the image that you see here. But beyond that, it is also a satellite hours display, wandering hours. Right now it's 530. Right now it's 540. You may not know that Vacheron made its own version of the famous star wheel, but it did. And so it's a digital time display where you read the hour adjacent to the minutes. And you can see a tribute to the Explorer himself written across the bottom. An absolutely spectacular watch powered by a JLC 889 base automatic winding with a 40 hour power reserve. The watch is reasonably sized and wears beautifully. It's also in outstanding condition. This is a work of art for your wrist. Cloisonne, miniature painting, and grand faux enameling to create the image of the Silk Road, Asia, and the trip from Europe to the Orient, traveled by Marco Polo in his lifetime, an explorer and a trader, both now immortalized in enamel and gold. And you can see the compass rose of the reverse side. That said, it's always tough to top a Patek Philippe perpetual calendar, especially when combined with a minute repeater. This, launched in 2012, is the Patek Philippe 5213G. It succeeded the original tonneau-shaped 5013 with an officer's case style. Now, Patek inaugurated its modern officer's case watches in 1989 during the 150th anniversary. Basically, it's a wristwatch designed to look as though it were converted from a pocket watch because that is the type of watch that would have been used by many officers during World War I when there was no time to reach for a watch in your pocket. The watch had to be worn on the wrist. As a result, many pocket watches were converted directly with lugs welded on and straps held on with screws and bars. This watch was built de novo as a wristwatch, but it has the look of a converted pocket watch. That's the idea. 40.3 millimeters in white gold. It features an aperture style perpetual calendar with a retrograde date, white gold breguet style numerals, breguet style hands in matching gold. You can see if I move the primary hands out of the way, the retrograde hand for the date, but it's also a minute repeater. And because it is based on the design of a pocket watch, it includes a hunter case back, and we're gonna explore all of this, but first we're gonna to listen to the repeater. I'm gonna open up the case back and fire away.
superb. And on top of that, you get both the solid gold case back and the sapphire, the highest level of Patek Philippe finishing, and you can see that with the exterior points, lateral bevels, and black polished tops of the minute repeater strikers. It is also a micro rotor automatic with a 45 to 48 hour power reserve. The watch is not as big as it looks. As you can see, it wears nicely on my smallish wrist, and it'll wear nicely on yours. It's low enough and flat enough and sloped enough to fit underneath the cuff. That is the Patek Philippe 5213G. Now, if that's even a little bit too large for you, I have this, which might be pretty close to the perfect watch, Patek Philippe 3970 EG. In gold, it is a tanche E with a screw and case back, and it is G, white gold. 36 millimeters in diameter. It is a Lemania based perpetual calendar chronograph, third series, 3970. And you can see that on the dial with the baton style hands and the dart indices. Perpetual calendar and chronograph, a famed signature of the Patek Philippe manufacturer dating back to the early 1940s. This is a signature watch for Patek, and from the 80s through early 2000s, 85 to 2004, the 3970 was the Patek Philippe Perpetual Calendar Chronograph. It was never alone in the catalog among complications, but it was always definitive as the Patek complication. You might have had a 5016 during that period, you might have had a 5004, but the heart and soul of Patek complicated watchmaking has always been the Perpetual Calendar Chronograph. Now flip it over, you see that Le Mans based CH2770Q, lateral clutch, column wheel, overcoil hairspring, 2.5 hertz beat rate, free sprung gyro max balance, Geneva hallmark finish, and of course it is beautiful to see and a tactile pleasure to operate. Throw it on the wrist, you can see why I consider this to be a universal watch for men or women as well as those with a taste for traditional and discreet sizing. With a black dial and lacquer and a white gold case at 36 millimeters, this is outstanding and for anyone. Reach out to Tmaso at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details.